So as I said, uh, I had a, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to be a student in Tel Aviv when when Yake was a, a teacher there, a, an admired teacher. Um, basically, everyone came out of Tel Aviv thinking that uh, only the foundations of quantum mechanics are a subject worth uh, studying. And many of us thought a lot about this subject. subject. And, and it's wonderful to see actually today for the first time for me, many of the people of this uh, period, uh, Lev and Sandu and uh, Daniel and, and, and others. Um, it really brings uh, um, many memories. Um, Michael already mentioned the Yakir's uh, um, enchantment with the paradoxes. Uh, there was a, a course uh, called the Famous Paradoxes in Modern Physics, which uh, made uh, all of us uh, very excited. And today, uh, one of us, uh, Sandu, Professor Sandu Popescu, who is uh, from the University of Bristol, like, uh, like uh, Michael, uh, will talk about the paradoxical uh, world of microscopic particles. Well, this is, I can hardly imagine a happier celebration. And not only because Yakir is 90, but because he's as quick now in thinking at 90 as he was so many years when I, when I first met him. So, what can I say? Well, first, let me say something that has just a little bit to do with Yakir, but with Michael. Michael, you succeeded to surprise me again. Where did you find that picture of Yakir with a tie? That is so there. <laughs> I've never seen him like that, only, only today. Okay, but coming back to Yakir. Uh, as you know, and as you've been told already many times today, Yakir did tremendous, tremendous contribution to physics. Or better say, in trying to understand how exactly nature is functioning. And although you've done this, you probably don't know exactly what Yakir has done. So I will try to tell you a little bit about this world in which Yakir spends a very, very long time of his every single day. So, you know, many of you, even the ones that you are not physicists, in fact, each of you, has some clear intuitions about many, many of the details of physics from everyday life. You know, you know that if you throw a stone harder, it will land further away. You know that you should be careful when you drive, because if you drive faster and you smash into something, you will be broken much more than if you do slower. So, in fact, we couldn't live if we do, would not understand basic things about physics. So, we all have an intuition about this. However, the moment you go to small particles, to microscopic particles, like atoms or molecules or subatomic particles, the way in which they behave is so unusual that we basically have no, no sort of intuition about what they are doing. And nothing in our everyday life ever prepared us to understand that. Now, to make sure we do have a theory that tells us about what they are doing. That theory is called quantum mechanics. And that theory, although we think of that as a something very modern, is in fact older than Yakir. So it's depending how you count, it started around 1900, or perhaps everything was already done by 1926. And it is our best theory of nature, which within our uh, power of computation, it explains virtually everything. Well, apart why things fall if you just drop them. So apart from gravity, it explains everything. It explains the fact that all the stuff around us is made out of atoms. It explains what atoms are, why they survive like that, I don't know, it explains light, it explains why a piece of metal is shiny, 
while a piece of wood is not, it virtually explains everything. However, just the fact that it explains everything, it doesn't mean, and the fact that we can calculate everything, it doesn't mean that we in fact understand it. Because see, one thing is to be able to do the following thing. Somebody gives you a problem and asks you, what will happen if you do this and that? And you are able to calculate the problem and give the answer. But that is only less than half of your job. More important is to find what is an interesting problem to solve. Now, we were able to, we, I mean, physicists were able to make a lot of progress understanding things in nature, but in some, some way, these things that are all around us, they are, in fact, very robust. They, they wouldn't be there if they would not be robust and somehow simpler. You know, something that you, you just go out and you find, you know, at random place in nature, they are not subtle enough. And in order to understand really deeply the theory, you have to go to much subtler sort of setups, which will reveal for you what nature actually is. And in fact, because everything is so counterintuitive, even today at a more than a hundred years, or well, a hundred years since the laws of physics are, are known, virtually everybody agrees that we do not have a real, true, deep, intuitive understanding of what quantum mechanics is. And Yakir is one of the people that did the most until now and continues to do in trying to understand this. So what I will try to to do today is just to show you a little bit of these uh, fascinating things. So I want to start with a very, very simple experiment. So imagine that you have here a particle. Any small thing will do, in fact. And here you have just a sheet of, say, metal or something, very, very thin. So what you do is the following. You throw this particle to that plate. And sometimes it may bounce off it. You try again. Well, that is very thin. And sometimes it may go through it. And you repeat this many times. So depending on how thin it is, you can arrange, say, that if you, if you start and you shoot one by one, one by one, a thousand small particles, then around 500 will bounce, 500 will go through. A very trivial example. So let me go a step further and do something more. So suppose what I do, I add here a thick wall that reflects everything that bounces, that hits it, and another very thin plate like that. OK, so now we start the experiment. So sometimes this may happen. The particle started from there, bounced here, is reflected by the wall, bounced there, and so on. Another time, it may bounce through the first, hit the wall, and go through the other. Other times, it may just go through the first one. So you try it a thousand times. And 500 times it goes, it pierces through this plate, and particles go through another half of the time. So another 500 particles go here and hit the second one, in which case they just go 250, 250. This is a standard experiment. You never actually do it like that, because whenever I want to express a real experiment, I need to simplify it, otherwise there are gaudy details. But this is the basic idea. So now, physicists thought a bit more, and they said, look, 
Let's try to make, since we are talking about small particles, let's try to make it cleaner and cleaner. So first of all, uh, you know, small particle coming here may hit a molecule in the air. So I need to take the air away so that nothing will, will collide or... So what they did, they uh, just put it, the entire thing, in a box. Maybe a tiny hole here to throw the particle in. Two holes there, so three holes to let the particles out. And took the air out of it. So nice and clean. They thought even more. You see, there is light there. That's why you see what happens. But just looking into it is not a passive thing. Because what happens? Light comes from that light bulb, hits me, and comes into your eye. Now, I'm pretty big, light is pretty small, it comes, it hits me, but I barely feel it. Now, if they are small particles, one should be more careful. So then scientists just turn the light off. So the experiment happens in a box. And uh, they do it again. So what they do, they throw the particle, and as expected, sometimes it goes through, Sometimes it bounces and comes up. Sometimes it bounces and comes down. And overall, as we discussed before, even in this clean version of experiment, you start with 1,000, 500 goes through, 250, 250. Good. Well, nothing really very exciting. But then people thought, OK, Let's uh, try to make it even more interesting. Let's put another, another wall there. So what could happen now? A particle could come here, bounce, go, bounce. Or it could come here, bounce, and go through this. Or it could go through, bounce here, bounce. Or it could go through, come here, and go through. It's really children's uh, play. So they put it, you know, this is what they, they expect. If I start <coughs> with a thousand, in half of the cases it will go up, half of the <coughs> cases will go down. Out of those 500, 250, 250 goes like this. Out of this 500, 250, 250. So overall, 500. And then they put it in the box. They took the air out of the box, they turned the light off, and they started the experiment. And the first particle goes and comes up upwards. The second particle goes, comes out upwards. The third particle goes, it goes up upwards. You send all thousand. All of them come here, none of them come there. So now comes the, the mystery. You see, when the lights were on, and there was a single wall there, a single wall there, this possibility was possible. It would bounce from here, be reflected by the wall, hit the second plate, and go through. If you put the other one, and you turn the lights off. Now, this became impossible because, remember, all the thousand went just out there. So how comes when a particle hits here and goes upwards, how does it know that there is a wall up there? So the important thing, these walls could be a long, long distance apart. They could be hundreds of kilometers. In theory, they could be as far as you want. There is nothing that the particle there apparently could feel what is here. But it so happened that it does. We run this experiment, we look at it, we put all kinds of devices here. If the particle, if we see the particle going that way, nothing is felt there. If we turn the light off, all thousand come up, upwards. 
Now, we do have the theory. The theory tells us how to compute and tells us what happens. And any student, apart from those that fail in the second year, there are plenty of them, uh, can calculate this immediately. But if you ask anyone what is really happening there, how can a particle go? And by the way, we can calculate whatever we want here. We can calculate what happens if we move this wall a little bit further, what will happen. We can calculate a lot of things. But if you ask what is happening there, nobody can really tell. For example, when Yakir was a student, and even today, if you would ask most physicists, they will say, look, the particle actually is in both places at the same time. It must, it must feel that wall and feel this wall. Now, of course, it's strange. I've never been in two places at the same time, despite the fact that many times I wished I would be able to do that. Uh, Yakir was also puzzled by this, and you would not be surprised to know that he thinks that uh, thinking of a particle at two places at the same time is not the correct way. But I will leave that for later. And you know, we need an intuition about this that goes beyond calculating in order to be able to say what happens. So, you know, scientists try, and they try to do it with the lights on. Put the light on, everything behaves normally. Take the light off when you don't see, and suddenly the mystery happens. OK, it is mysterious. And uh, a way to approach, which I saw from Yakir from the beginning, is to try to look at more interesting things that you can do with it. If you just stay at this level and you start scratching your head and you ask, how is it possible? How is it possible? And you go again, and how is it possible? You will never really understand. Start playing with it. So one thing, for example, that Yakir did, and I, uh, I was hoping that Michael will not just destroy my talk completely, uh, is to play with magnets. So, you know, physicists like to play with magnets, not only because magnets are fascinating, and, uh, you know, probably all of you played with a magnet, uh, but because a magnetic force is one of the fundamental forces in nature. So, give an experimentalist any system, very soon he will put a magnetic field on it to see what happens. So, imagine that you have a bar magnet like this, um, there is something funny about it. If you played with it, you would see that it attracts things at the top, at the North Pole, at the South Pole. Here in the middle, not very much. So if you imagine a very, very long one, and you, if you have one at home, try. And if you have a long magnet like that, here in the middle, you don't really feel the magnet. Or, even better, if you would make the magnet just like a circle, then you will not see anything out. You need to really enter the magnet in order to feel the magnetic force. So, one of the things Yakir did was the following. He took this arrangement that we know, and he put a magnet like this, perpendicular to the screen. So, there is the magnet. And then he imagines something else. Let me put a barrier around the magnet to make sure that a particle will never enter it. Now, there is no magnetic field anywhere. And whatever you do, you don't know whether there is a magnet inside this barrier or there isn't. Shoot a particle there, shoot it here, do whatever experiment you want, you will never see. Put this thing in a box, take the air out, turn the light off, and you'll see sometimes a thousand particle and zero. That happens if there is no magnet in. Put a magnet, might be 900 and 100. Put a stronger one, 
might be 500, 500. Put even a stronger one, zero and a thousand. Put it even stronger, you get to the beginning. So somehow, although you have this, uh, you know, mysterious thing that the particle needs to sample both places at the same time, either by being in the same place or by any other more subtle ways, it is able to feel something in the middle. Now, this is more important than the previous one, just the arrangement without the magnet. Because there, no matter how you thought of it, the particle had access to both that wall and this wall. So somehow there was a possibility, even if you didn't know how the particle samples those places, that it could find information about them. Here is more profound. The particle cannot enter the magnet. It doesn't have access into it. And nevertheless knows that the magnet is there. So what you have here discovered is that nature is non-local. You have something here. It doesn't send anything out. You cannot enter in order to touch it. And nevertheless, you are able to know. This is an enormous change of our view of the world. In our view of the world, everything is local. Thank you. Everything is local. I throw a stone, the stone goes all the way from me to the target. I talk to you, I push the air, and the air starts vibrating and hits you and moves, moves the membrane in your ear. Everything is local. Here it is non-local. The nature around us is truly non-local. OK, what else can we do? Well, somebody mentioned uh, the Nobel Prize. But let me tell you about another paper in Yakir's uh, PhD in Bristol. So here it is. Imagine again this setup. But now I have two particles. And uh, each of them with two thin plates, two walls, and so on. And I bring them one next to the other. So I don't know, and I will make this experiment again in the dark so that nothing interferes. But now, when it happened that the two particles are there together, they may influence each other. Well, if one is up here and the other one is there, they don't. Now, when we are describing objects, we know objects are made out of particles, and each particle is an individuality. Tell what one particle is doing, where it is, how it moves, tell what another one is doing, and then you can find what happens when they, when they interact. But each of them can be described by a state of itself. Now, what happens in this situation, after these two particles pass that point, now, we don't know exactly how, whether they are in two places at the same time or not, but what physics tells us that they lose their individuality. Somehow their state is entangled, is a common state of both of them that cannot be, cannot be described. Uh, but people thought that they maintain that entanglement only when they are interacting. The question is, do they also maintain when they are far apart? And the Akir and Bohm were the first to prove by looking at an experiment that was done for completely different reasons, that particles, even if they are very far apart, they maintain this entanglement. Their state is a common state. All the experiments that got the Nobel Prize today are based on this idea, the fact that entanglement survives at a distance. Now, I've been told conflicting things probably. You said two minutes, there was one minute. I will take just 30 seconds. Ah, always not. Ah, 
So Yaquil proved that nature is non-local. As Michael said, he proved that influence can propagate forward and backward in time. And many, many other things. And one of the driving things Yakir uh, told me from day one when I arrived there is to try to understand free will. Can we decide what we want to do despite that physics does not have at present any tools? Physics at present cannot explain whether somebody like me, for example, would decide now to continue to talk too much or to say thank you very much. Thank you very much.